Hello, and welcome to the Inside AVs podcast for December the, the 11th, 2020. This is episode number 36. Today, we'll be talking about solid state battery breakthroughs, Toyota bringing an EV to the US, and the Hyundai Ionic 5 is launching early 2021. I'm Dominic Chioni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, Inside EVs editor and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge with Tom Malogny, which has a strong focus on home charging stations. Uh, we also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from the Out of Spec Studios YouTube family of channels. Uh, he also puts together superb videos for the Inside U EVs YouTube channel. Go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. So welcome, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. Um, all right, so this was a big week for solid state batteries. Um, not one, but two different companies trotted out their technologies this week to show us what they have and what they hope to do in the future uh, when they begin to when they begin manufacturing cells in earnest. Uh, solid state batteries have been touted by some as the holy grail of batteries for some time. They are defined basically as a battery with a solid electrode and solid electrolyte. Uh, traditional batteries typically use a liquid gel or gel liquid or gel electrolyte. Um, I believe their most desirable characteristics is resistance to combustion. So they are therefore like safer. They've also been touted as being uh, capable of high energy density when made with lithium metal anodes. Uh, in the past, we've heard just generalized claims, but uh, these two companies this week offered a lot more specifics that will help us better judge where they are in, in terms of competing uh, battery technologies. So uh, the two companies I'm talking about are Solid Power and QuantumScape. And then there was a surprise little announcement this morning from Toyota, and we'll get to that in a bit. Um, so let's talk about Solid Power just to start. They announced that they have a cell uh, that can be made with traditional lithium battery equipment that has a gravimetric density. Now that's the energy per unit of weight, so of 330 watt hours per kilogram. Uh, by the time they're ready to sell the batteries to automakers, that number, they say, could be above 350 watt hours per kilogram. So for context, the 2170 cell from Tesla and Panasonic are about 250 watt hours per kilogram or so. So, you know, that's significantly better than what uh, Tesla is using now. Um, right. So, and the, they also claimed a charging speed of about 50, uh, 80% in 15 minutes, which is uh, not too bad. Uh, so, all right. Does anyone have anything they want to say about solid power right now? Or um, should we move on this quantum scape? Well, you know, I, I don't have anything specifically to say about solid power. I haven't. Uh, admittedly been following the individual companies um, and to see what they've been doing because I'm kind of waiting until we have something that's really close to production. We've been hearing that solid state batteries are going to be the next big thing for a long time now. Yeah. And, you know, with, with um, uh, you know, battery technology, you know, we get these kind of incremental um, improvements and then every 10 or 20 years we get this big improvement. And the solid state batteries were really supposed to be the next really big improvement as good as tesla's announcement recently has been with their new cells that that wasn't that giant leap forward that a new technology provides we had the nickel metal hydride batteries that initially really enabled electric mobility um, because they were a huge step um, better than the, the lead acid batteries that had been used before that and then when uh, lithium ion batteries came uh, it became you know, even easier to propel a vehicle and store enough energy where it can go far enough. Since then, we've had these little incremental increases and we've been hearing about these um, uh, uh, possible solid state batteries for a long time now. You even know uh, Hemrick Fisker promised one for 2021. Now we have a bunch of companies. We have three that we're talking about today. I don't get too excited until, you know, we can say, okay, these are going to be in next year's model vehicle because you know, it's great to have these improvements, Dom, and 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 have companies come out and say, "Look, we've we've cracked the problem of the 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 separator or whatever the the issue was." But you know, it's it's tough to get excited because we've been getting these for like the last you know number of years that we're right around the corner. It's it's going to be there, right. 
And we're still talking about, they're still talking about four or five years before, I think four years before this is ready. And, you know, generally, what what are solid state batters going to do? They're, they're better performance. They should allow us to have the, the vehicles at lower cost. Um, they can provide faster charging. They're more stable, less chance of possible fire. And they have this higher energy density that you spoke about. So, yeah, they're great. And uh, it's great that we see progress here. But I can't get too excited until we're like a year away from actually having them. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the batteries, man. It, it's a whole time. I've been, you know, looking at electric vehicles for like probably close to 15 years now. And batteries have always been like the big thing. And, but you know, there, this is a, this is decent progress where we're at today. We finally have, you know, cars that can go f three, 400 miles. as was, you know, it was crazy to even consider back, back a decade ago. But, uh, yeah, so let's just take a quick look at what QuantumScape is doing as well, because maybe they uh, they they made the bigger splash. I think um, they had they held an online Zoom meeting and introduced the team uh, with and various backers, and one of those was JB Straubel, uh, best known as a co-founder and former chief of technology at Tesla, and he more recently founded the uh, battery recycling company Redwood, Redwood Materials. So QuantumScape is also looking at the 2025 timeframe to begin producing cells for customers. Unlike solid power, they didn't bring up gravimetric density, preferring instead to talk about volume metric density. That's traditionally been a signal to me that the, the energy density isn't the strong point of the tech. Uh, I did notice one chart though that seemed to indicate they have an, en an energy density of about 360 watt hours per kilogram. So I think a little bit better than what uh, solid power uh, thinks they can bring. Um, but that maybe not its biggest strength. Uh, that would seem to be charging speed. They claim their battery cell can recharge from empty to 80% in 15 minutes, which is, uh, I think probably fast as fast as anything or faster than anything we have right now. And they had a, like a, the, uh, their cell had like a C rate of about 25, which is super, super high. Um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I was going to want to explain what C rate is, but that's very complicated, kind of complicated to say, sum up real quick. Uh, so look it up on Wikipedia. Yeah. Uh, so, but anyway, so I think they can, I think they can reduce that charging, charging speed zero to 80% in 15 minutes. I'm, there might be another bottleneck in there somewhere, but I, I think they could probably get that under 10 minutes. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, Tom, uh, is that kind of speed in 2025 or even uh, energy density, for that matter, does that seem like a breakthrough to you? Yeah, well, I mean, the charging speed, we're close to that now with some yeah. of these cars. Like, right. like a, uh, you know, I think my, my when I did the Model 3 V3 supercharger test last year and Kyle did it also, I think it gets to 80% in 22 minutes. So, um, and the Taycan gets to it in about that time. So um, we're already pretty darn fast with the cells we have. Right. But of course, we need to get faster and compressing that. It was kind of easier probably to get to where we are now than to, than to, continue to get it faster because we have such high char recharge rates now. But, um, you know, I mean, that's that's going to be super important with battery tech moving forward, because for the majority of, of, of people transitioning to an electric vehicle, the, the high speed recharging is going to have to be brilliant um, for people to accept it because they've been conditioned their whole life that they're five to eight minutes at a gas station and uh, and they're on their way with a full tank. So we've got to get to around 10 minutes, in my opinion, yeah. to get to 80% in order for the vast majority of people to, to transition to EVs. Now, I know it doesn't make sense because it's a different paradigm with electric vehicle charging than gasoline refueling. So I know people are going to say, oh, yeah, but it doesn't matter because you charge at home and you do this and you do that. And I get that. But I'm talking about people that are transitioning to electric vehicles and never owned them before. They've driven their gas cars their whole life. And, and now you're telling them, oh, they have to wait, you know, three or four times as long as what they're usually waiting to refuel. And that's going to scare them. Uh, so we, we do need to work on this. And that would be great if if, if we can get that, that 80 percent charge rate down um, close to 10 minutes. If you're looking at YouTube now, you can see on the screen it has a uh, quantum scape energy density. So on the left hand side, the axis, I'm not sure if it's like, you know, above 350, but I think it's kind of. I, I suspect it's going to be below 400. 400 is like a kind of a magic number for energy density. Uh, and I think that's where it I both actually, that's where I think both Tesla and 
uh, GM and LG with the LTM batteries are, are going to be in that neighborhood by 2025 too. So. So this is all looking, you know, ahead of ahead into the future. Like you said, Tom, it's like it is out there a little bit, but still, you know, I think I think it's worth considering what where we're going to be. And so, um, my uh, yeah, Tom, my, my point isn't that it's worthless because we're not there, right, um, right? Because you have to you have to build to get there. Um, I, I'm just saying it's hard for me to personally get excited about this. Because following this industry, like we all have for so closely for so long, we've seen these announcements, you know, time and time again for the last four or five years. It's like, all right, bring me the damn battery and I'll get excited about it. You know, it's like 2025 is still like it's just too far for me to reach and grab. But yes, I'm very happy that we're seeing this now and that there really seems to be a lot of movement in solid state battery space. Yeah. Hey, Kyle, do you have any thoughts about this? I know you're more of a car guy than a battery guy, but I'll start getting into solid state. Look, I I get the technology. I think it's really cool. There's a lot of benefits and I'm pretty sure we actually have solid state applications in some vehicles. Am I incorrect in thinking that the BYD blade battery is solid state? No, that's not solid state. It's, it's uh, not? Okay. No, no. Forget I said I that. I don't, think, I don't think it is now. No, it's like a metal uh, FE. Or... I knew it was some basic type of or different type of battery that was way more stable. And I think that's where I made that connection. Yeah, it's, just, it's, totally it's, the cobalt, it's the cobalt free lithium ion phosphate. That's what it is. Free. Sorry you know, you for can, uh, you can right. shoot it. Shoot it with a gun. Jumping it won't go there. bang. Right. <laughs> it's exactly. kind of an that's older technology though. That. Yeah. No, yeah, so, yeah. so uh, uh, solid state seems cool. But again, it just seems cool. Like Tom, uh, you know, certainly we're not I am not a battery expert. I uh, can certainly evaluate a car. I enjoy that. So once it's in a car, I'll need to become an expert in solid state batteries. And uh, that'll force me to do it whenever the first one hits the market. But up until then, this is all just, this maybe will make it. Uh, I don't get excited about the race for any of this stuff. I think our batteries today are pretty damn good. So that's just my right. uh, my sure. opinion. Right. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I think my, my takeaway from this is that this is a, like a breakthrough for solid state batteries, not so much batteries overall, um, but it shows that they will be, you know, competitive with what the, the chemistries that are being developed now or the technology that are being developed now by uh, both uh, Tesla and LG and GM working together on the LTM thing. Um, yeah. And, but they have a lot of scale. So I was kind of thinking, well, maybe the, uh, these these new new companies can compete on price, but man, t Tesla and and LG have a like a serious advantage with with the scale of their operations right now, and that you know volume just drives pricing so much lower. So it's going to be interesting to see how this you know folds out over the next what, uh, I guess maybe four years now. It's like almost twenty twenty one guys. So, uh, but moving on a little bit, but staying with solid state batteries. Um, Toyota, so this disc, I just noticed this this morning. I think this came out yesterday. Uh, Toyota will apparently have a solid state battery in a vehicle uh, very soon, maybe sooner than these other guys. They've been working at it for a while, uh, but they've been very tight lipped about it. Uh, they will show a, a vehicle this in, in 2021, I'm thinking this year, 2021, uh, and as a prototype. It will, and they say it's going to be capable of like 300 miles and a charge and a, a recharge time. Get this from zero to full in 10 minutes, or it could be zero to 80%. I'm not sure if I wrote that down wrong. Um, but still, like 10 minutes, that's faster than, you know, the other, the other guys are saying, like, you know, in 2025. So if this comes in as a prototype, this in 2021, you know, maybe by 2022, they'll have a, or 2023. They'll have a uh, in a car. Martin, any thoughts? Yeah, I think I don't know why. If if they're confident of the technology, why they wouldn't put it on their on their roadmap, or they wouldn't put pure electric cars on their roadmap, which Toyota aren't doing. So we see this with uh, other car companies. You know, VW are doing it with their ID range. There's stuff coming over the next few years that isn't ready yet, but they know will be. Tesla are famous for it. You know, releasing the Roadster uh, with a 200 kilowatt hour pack and uh you know that technology when they unveiled that car 
it, it's now clear to all of us that technology, apart from double stacking a you know a Model S long range pack, which was not doable in a Roadster, that technology didn't exist. But they knew that when the car hit the market, it would exist. Uh, they're doing it with the Semi and, and Cybertruck as well. So because you know with with their new their new cells there. So I don't understand that if Toyota were confident of having the cells, why they wouldn't put battery electric vehicle you know a really robust bev roadmap in place for 23 24 25 2030 etc but they they're still i mean they they might be holding all of their cards very close to their chest and then just one day they're going to go there you go 50 cars are coming they're all gonna have solid state batteries um the case you're referring to that toyota story today is they're going to have a prototype made by the end of the year the good thing about that is they're going to make the car. So there'll be a prototype car moving around uh, with these batteries. Um, but again, you know, they're, they're making um, uh, a big deal of it. And, and I do wonder whether uh, it's, it's, it's as important for Toyota. You know, I think that this technology becomes really, really interesting with, uh, you know, Elon Musk more often than not says 400 is the number for aviation. Um, and so aviation is exciting you know, lightweight, different vehicle forms, commercial vehicles, lightweight vehicles, um, you know, small personal mobility vehicles with long range or great performance enabled by next generation technology. The, the problem I have is I think Toyota feel they can't make a pure electric, a compelling pure electric car until they've unveiled this technology, which they've been working on for a very long time. I don't know how much they spent on it, but it feels like they're waiting to go right now we're ready and in the meantime in the last 20 years the world's moved on right the kind of cars that we talk about week in week out on this show don't need solid state as tom says we're not discounting it because it then opens up different use cases and potentially lower cost and so potentially lots of exciting applications do we need them to have fast charging, long range, affordable electric cars. Well, no, not really. So we're, you know, we're there now. And the thing is, Solid Power made a, a point that their technology works with existing lithium ion battery production. Yes, manufacturing, yep. Right, so whereas Quantum didn't, that is a, a new way of producing. So, you know, there are so many gigafactories. You know, the, there are more gigafactories uh, in the world than in China than, than anywhere else. Of course, Tesla gets again all the oxygen gets sucked out of the room because of Tesla. But um, those factories are you know either operational or being built. If you look at places like uh, you know with the US uh, with uh, the Chattanooga plant, which will enable the cheaper VW ID4. There are so many massive factories being built now that they're all going to come online around the time that these solid state batteries are uh, you know are, are going to be ready and then even then i think the the trial line so the 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 trial line for tesla's 4680 cells is 10 annualized capacity of 10 gigawatt hours a year sort of by this time next year uh, i think and that's their pilot line uh, i think quantum scapes pilot line was two gigawatt hours by 2025 i need to look at the slides again after watching that zoom presentation but again the numbers are smaller and four years away and it's hard not to discount some you know come across as a you know negative but uh, it's exciting we don't martin do you think that the only reason that toyota has not released a full battery electric compelling roadmap is because they're still trying to work out how to make it self-charging <laughs> That's what it is. They're like, well, we <laughs> it's got to be. We don't want to put a plug socket on it. So how do we make a self-charging car that you don't put any fuel in? Uh, they'll get there. They'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, goodness. Aptera says that they figured that one out. I know we're going to talk about point. that. That's a good point. Maybe Toyota, Toyota, Toyota get into that. Aptera. The, the thing uh, about Toyota, and I've been one of their biggest um, uh, bashers for the last few years, because mainly because it, they so disappoint me. I, I've owned many Toyotas. I own one now. I own a Toyota Tacoma truck, but I vowed that that was going to be the last Toyota I bought because they've been so anti-EV. Um, but you just wonder, like, if – they're going to just be in the stealth mode, EV stink, like we're never going to make them. And, you know, we're going to go right to fuel cells. 
But then one day they're just going to be like, boom, <laughs> like we've perfected the solid state battery. It's got, you know, 400 you know, watt hours per kilogram. And uh, here we go, you know, 10 new EVs in the next year and a half. Mm. And, you know, we're phasing out ice and like all of a sudden the whole industry is going to be like, holy shit, what just happened? <laughs> you know, like, you know, you just wonder because how could they be – but how it's it's puzzling to me how they've taken this this stand, this anti EV stance. So you wonder if they're just not um, you know uh, hurting their existing sales by saying you know hybrids are the best and hybrid, and don't forget they own. I don't know if it is currently, but within the last couple of years they made eighty percent of the world's hybrids Toyota mm, yeah. of yeah. the world. Like that's insane. Who controls eighty percent? of any segment of the automobile industry mm. worldwide. You know, so so it's their cash cow. Why yeah. would, if you own this company, if you're investors, if you're, you know, running the company, why do you want to give that up? So, you know, uh, I understand their position, uh, you know, on, on this purely financial, but uh, hopefully in the background, they're like, okay, we know EVs are the future. So really secret quietly, we'll like build this whole building. You just perfect that damn thing. And when it's ready, that's when we're going to come to market. We're just going to blow everybody away. Right. You know, uh, we'll have to wait and see. I hope that's the case. Well, I think it's significant that they, they brought up this battery like this this time because the other bit of news to, that goes along with this is that uh, apparently they they plan on bringing an all electric vehicle to North America. They say in the short term, uh, and the short term here seems to be within three years. And oh. it's like it's likely to be built on the E that T N G A platform. Um, so taking that news and this whole state battery news, I mean, this could be. You know, the vehicle coming, you know, solid state battery vehicle on the market in the U.S. in three years. I'm, you know, fingers crossed because, I mean, yeah. So as you may know, uh, Toyota hasn't had an all electric in its lineup in the U.S. for years, um, mm. despite the fact that it had, you know, two different generations of the RAV4 EV. Um, it's been it's been preferring to put its efforts into hydro hybrids and hydrogen and fuel cell vehicles. And and though I I think we can probably most agree that its new uh, RAV4 Prime is a pretty decent plug-in. It's not being produced in high volume yet, so uh, it's still, you know, we're still a little bit frustrated with them. Um, so we don't have a lot of details, much in the way of details on this new vehicle. Uh, maybe we can make some good guesses. I don't know, is this, this could be a brand new vehicle or perhaps it's uh, a, one of the electrics that they already sell in China on the uh, same the same e dash tnga platform which um like the like that's the lexus ux 300e uh they have a toyota uh, chr as well electrified in china uh kyle do you think what do you think they're going to bring here alexis toyota it's hard to say really it just comes down to cost like uh you know, I, I guess I have no no real prediction in this. I think we, we all agree on Toyota and Lexus not doing anything exciting. And uh, I have a RAV4 Prime next week, though. Oh, really? So we'll, yeah, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I mean, I've driven the RAV4 Prime. I've right. done a few videos on it by now. I like it. Do I love it? No. Really? Uh, yeah, I don't. I, it's still okay. a compromise. It's still okay. something you have to plug in all the time. It's actually more annoying to own than a full electric car because you have to constantly plug it in to drive it on electric right. uh, you know if you're trying to optimize also it's kind of expensive and it's not premium uh it's built well but it's like for the same money i'd honestly rather have an id4 uh or something like this so um you know look it's a good car really quick handles well but I don't know, I, and I don't know what the future looks like for the company. We haven't seen anything super compelling, uh, and we've seen no messaging that's super compelling. So, I, what what do you think, Dom? You think we're going to see a, a a cool new EV coming from them in the next five years? That's going to be on par with the rest of the market, or is it going to take them a long time to catch up once they start making EVs? I suspect their battery is not going to be. If, well, this this fast charging part has to be really excited, but I'm less convinced about the energy density if they're just saying you know 500 kilometers or 310 miles on a charge you know in like a, a few years from now because you know everyone else is already kind of like right about there and yeah I, and there's also the uh, 
the Subaru E-Voltus. That's uh, Subaru is partly owned now by Toyota. So that vehicle could be, could be part of this whole program as well. We don't really know. Um, I think the, the concept, that concept was revealed last April. Uh, yeah, in 2020. And so hopefully we're going to see something about that soon. Maybe that's going to be also part of this, you know, solid state battery coming in three years, maybe part of that family. I mean, if it's, if it's on the same, I'm not sure if the Voltus is on the same platform or not. Anyone know? No, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, course, I mean, it's all. That is one ugly car, though. Yeah. What are people doing? Right. It looks a little like the Faraday Future, doesn't it? Yeah, it just is not pretty. What's up with the I wheel arches? This... Why are the black plastic bits so big? It's like a mini GP, like the new Gen 3 John Cooper Works GP with those stick on carbon fiber wheel arches. This is like the oh. bigger and more offensive version of that. Right. Uh, these yeah. ones look flush, though. The, the one on the John Cooper Mini will kind of stick out like a little bit of oh, air. It's so bad, but this, you know, it's just so ugly either way from a side <laughs> profile. Can I can I ask what you think? Like, if I spin around, you know, the 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 optimistic view, they're going to come out one day and just be like, ta-da! Right. Can I, can I just turn that around? Is there a chance that they are more crippled than any of us realize by their success? As, as Tom said, 80% of the global hybrid market uh, is is are they in a a potential situation where they are terrified to do anything that that kills off that cash cow? Because I find that hard to believe. They're such a big company, so much talent, so many great engineers work for them, working on some exciting things. But at the very top level, is it a possibility that they are just gonna slowly commit suicide and just stick with hybrids? Man, That's I, mean, the I don't know. I don't know. So far, they're kind of already there right now. But right. does it actually matter in a global market right now? No, EVs are still such a small percentage of what everyone's buying. So, look, I I actually don't think that'll be the case. I think Toyota will be around. Uh, you know, they're so big. I don't want to say they're too big to fail. They're certainly mm. not that. But I think uh, they'll they'll make electric. It's not hard to make an electric car. Uh, they can just go to anyone building a platform and just say, hey, can we have your platform and batteries? And then we yeah. save ourselves all of the engineering costs. You've seen them do this with the Supra, right, with BMW. They said, hey, can we have your Z4? And then they slapped a hard top on it. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it, it's something they might just go and say, who's building the best one that can produce enough? And we'll just buy it from them. Yeah, they did that with uh, Peugeot Citroen, PSA Group. Um uh, they've got yes, the, they did. Uh, yeah, the like, they've got that, and they're like, "Can we just so they'll just can we use your technology, and they'll add their margin on top." Yep. Meanwhile, they're making all their money from hybrids. They they can never compete fully on price whilst they are a customer of other people's products, but they might not care. I I think like, like you were saying before, Martin. I think they're just like really holding their cards close to the vest. They have to have some plan. I mean, they have to, right? <laughs> they're too I mean, the hybrids too are great, good. but that's like, like the now technology. They, they, if they're, you know, any business needs to be thinking, you know, five years, 10 years down the road, they need and to, you don't have get to where like, they don't get to where they are today without being really good at running their company. Right. Have you guys read the innovators dilemma? No, I haven't read it, but I've heard about it. Well, Look it up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Weekend reading. Yeah, it's it it basically definitely well basically definitely great. Um, <laughs> uh, it 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 explains how the these innovators these like market leaders like say Toyota they're so good with hybrids and they're they've made it a science out of just um, incrementally improving this and they, they're so good at it that they can't culturally in the company they can't make this this giant switch to something that is uh, uh such a, a disruptive technology and it in the end it ends up doing them you know and and we, we've seen this in other industries where you know the, these market leaders fall very quickly from a disruptive technology and you say like how did they not see this i mean look at how blackberry like owns mm. like you know um yeah. personal uh you know devices for businesses and 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 you know uh, there's sony there's there's plenty of examples polaroid uh and and how did that how did these giant companies just get crushed by this new technology and it's because they just kept 
holding on to their previous technology and saying, well, we can just we can make it better. We can make it compete with this new technology by by adding a little bit of a bigger battery. You know, it's still mm. going to be a hybrid, but but now it'll have 50 miles of range, you know, and and, and then by the time it, it, they realized that they needed to pivot, it's too late. And, and the market has has passed them. So, I mean, Toyota, that's how I have held my belief that was the case with Toyota. I believe and have believed that that is going to ultimately doom the company, that they just w- will refuse to let go of, of, of the technology that they're so good at making. Right. But that's why I, I said before to Martin, well, wouldn't it be, you know, uh, something if that really isn't the case and they really have this this ultra top secret, you know, uh, uh, program where they're like perfecting solid state batteries. And one day they're just going to dump them on us and be like, Hey, you know, I, I see your, uh, new battery cells, I- Elon, and uh, I raise you these, you know, and, uh, and now we, here's our product pipeline. We've got 10 EVs coming out in 2024, 15 more in 2025, 20 more in 2026. By the end of the decade, we're going to be 80% electric and like, you know, boom, uh, that's probably less likely than them being crippled by their own success with hybrids, but it's possible. You know, it, it, it could be what's going on with Toyota right now. I was talking to an automotive engineer earlier in the week um, about what's the, the upcoming called Euro 7 emissions regulations uh, a couple of years away, not fully defined yet, and and, and, and various stakeholders are having their say on them. Um, but but this, like I say, an automotive engineer who works in the in in the space of of, of powertrains uh, and drivetrains was saying uh, that with Euro 7, the CO2 emissions uh, for it within EU are going to be so tight that they're going to need really, really good hybrid technology. And this is someone who spends their life dedicated, like, you know, in that world. And I just thought it was interesting that, that the response wasn't, you know, they're going to need electric cars. Right. But he's like, oh, how can we make this 5% better to meet the new... Like, his take was... How can we make a better hybrid rather than, you know what, by 2025, don't even bother, just make electric cars. It's going to spend so much money being compliant, just make zero emissions cars. And I thought, as I thought, oh, hang on, yeah, the, can you not see, you know, the wood for the trees? Right. But, All right. And, and what, so that's, that's pretty exciting news, though, I think, overall. Um, it's still a little future, it's still a little out there, but... And we don't even know what anything's going to look like, but you know, mm. we can we can all imagine like a you know compact mid-sized crossovers, right? Just a matter of is it going to be a thirty thousand dollar Toyota, or is it after incentives, or is it going to be you know an eighty thousand dollar Lexus? And we got and we got a weekend reading tip as well, if bonus. So you know. Oh yes, right, right. <laughs> what was that again, Tom? The inventor's dilemma. In- innovators. Innovators. innovators dilemma. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So last week we touched briefly on the new electric platform that the Hyundai Group is rolling out for its brands. Um, that's the E E G M P E G M P or whatever. Um, so now we learned that the first vehicle to sit on this platform will be the Hyundai Ionic Five. So we first saw this car in concept form at the Toyota or at the Toyota at the at the oh. Frankfurt Frankfurt Motor Show in September of 2019. Uh, We've been seeing some spy shots of it recently. Like uh, just in, yesterday, we have it here on the screen. Now you can see it. We published a post with some photos. Uh, still a lot of camo on it. Uh, you can see the headlights, though, and the taillights seem pretty similar to those that we saw in the concept. Uh, it's a pretty sporty looking uh, crossover. I think it, I think it, there's something underneath that. It's, I think it's going to look good. Tom, uh, what kind of expectations do you have for this car? And when, when they say launch, uh, do they mean like on sale? That's you know in 2021, or is that just the production version being shown with the customer deliveries maybe later in the year or early 2022? I'm pretty sure they mean it's going to be in showrooms like seven months from now, yeah. which is incre- incredible. You know, I mean that's that's awesome to to see. It looks um, like it's going to be a little bit bigger than the Kona. It's kind of the same type of vehicle as the Kona, just a little bit stretched out, almost like you know. Uh, more more comparable to uh, the Kia Nero, um, mm. which which I, I like the Kona. The one thing that I criticized with it was just a little bit too small. Almost bought it before I got my Model Three in two thousand nineteen. Um, but 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 the fact that the rear seat 
and the rear legroom was was is really poor on the Kona, in my opinion. And, and I have to shuffle my my elderly parents around frequently, and it was just, would have been just too tight for them. If it was in a package like this, um, I might have ended up with that as opposed to the Model Three. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is exciting. Uh, uh, you know, I like what Hyundai's Hyundai's doing with their EVs. They're very efficient. The Ionic is an incredibly efficient uh, EV. Hopefully. Um, I'm, I'm sure this will have that, their, uh, their, their great efficiency tech in it also. I'm interested to see how, this being a purpose-built uh, electric vehicle, uh, you know, it, is it even more efficient? Now, I know it's, it's, it doesn't have the, the, the proper shape to, say, be more efficient than the Ionic, which is a very slippery sedan, but um, I'm, I really can't wait to get behind the wheel of this thing and test out uh, the efficiency and, uh, you know, drivability being uh, Hyundai's first real purpose-built electric vehicle. Um, I think it's oh. great. It just adds to that class. Now, look at how many, I mean, that's kind of in the ID4, M Mustang Mach-E, Model Y, I Just they just keep coming in this class. It's like, okay, this type of electric vehicle, we, we have it. Let's Work on something else, guys. <laughs> we have a, we have enough of these right now. There's a lot of crossovers. Yeah, this one's kind of sporty looking. Like the corner, like the corner you're saying, the corner electric. You know, it's kind of small. This one looks like it may have a like a lower roof, possibly. It just looks a little sportier, but maybe stretched out a little bit longer. I don't know, Kyle. What do you think about this thing? Uh, it's really hard to say. I hate that sloping back line. I hope that's not final right. because then that means you can't really put the dogs uh -huh. in the back of it, which is the problem with the Kona. There's not enough room to put luggage and dogs. You know, I've spent tons of time in Kona EV, probably 10,000 miles and uh, wasn't able to ever fit like only one time, like cram everyone in there. Sure. The Nero's the better option. This might be somewhere in between uh, look, uh, uh, we've talked about it on last show, perhaps I can't remember. Hyundai has a way of making cars incredibly magically efficient. So I'm really hoping that this is a crossover with amazing efficiency. Uh, you know, we, we're not seeing huge range numbers, but we, uh, we hope it will be, you know, somewhat efficient because, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to look later on when we get the, all of the SUVs together, CUVs, um, you know, we're going to do a range test and they're all driving down the same road. I'm going to do XC40, Polestar 2, Nero, Kona, Bolt. Uh, what else do we have? I, we're just going to do a, a, a ID4 Maki, right. like a giant comparison of 15 cars, whatever it is. Uh, we're going to plan that for 2021 and uh, we're going to do a big shootout, an EV shootout, you know, uh, We'll see how it goes. Hopefully we can get this, you know, if it's towards the end of 21, it sounds like we might be able to squeeze this into our yeah. uh, testing program for those. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm liking this. This is like, this would be a great surprise if, if this shows up like this year, because it's like, oh, it'd be right in the mix with the, with the ID4 and the Aria and the Mach-E. And, uh, and to your to your point about the uh, uh, efficiency, this is like on, on the new platform. So it's going to be even more efficient than what they've been producing already. It's got the, the silicone carbide power electronics, you know, uh, uh, the range is kind of, you know, I don't know. We've apparently it's supposed to be like, uh, 311 miles. WLTP is a uh, right. I saw that, but who knows? That's like 250 EPA, which is like on paper, they're all starting to look the same. Right. I guess the bigger question here though, is which is, which one of these, million different CUV electrics that you can choose from appeals to you the most. For me, it's still the ID4. Um, I'm curious. I just think it's the best value proposition. It's almost like that is the car. That's the new benchmark. Forget about Model Y. You have to beat ID4 in terms of features, quality, looks, uh, and and the price point, of course. So, so I'm curious, what do you guys think? Out of all of the new CUVs, what would you go for? Martin. Your family man? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, the ID4 is probably top, but I am still hung up. I gotta get over it that they make uh, that they bury 125 kilowatt charging deep in the options menu. Otherwise, it comes with oh, 50. Oh, that's right. Uh, in the I'm US, still, we're I'm all still... 125 standard. 
I'm still sore, uh, and I, I, it appears also holding a grudge. So I need to perhaps speak to someone next week about this. <laughs> I go get some professional help. If it wasn't for that, it would. Uh, I go ID four, Tom. Yeah, a after driving the ID four, I'm sold. Um, and, you know, if you if you read my uh, first drive review I did a couple months ago, um, you'll you'll clearly see that. Uh, I think that this is going to be an absolute home run for, for Volkswagen. I think this will be the highest volume selling electric vehicle from, of any EV from like a legacy brand. Uh, they're they're going to sell totally tons agree. of things once people get, you know, maybe not the first year or so because, I, you know, we still have people that are a little, you know, concerned about transitioning to electric vehicles. And, and like we also said, Kyle and I have both talked about this at great length. We, do, we don't see this necessarily – um, going after, and Volkswagen has told us they're not going after Model Y and Mach E buyers. They're going after mainstream families. They're going after the the Honda um, CRV, the Toyota Rav4 customers. They say put this thing up against those vehicles; it'll beat them in nearly every category, um, and it's much less expensive to operate. So, I mean, that's families need something that's reliable, that it has tons of utility, that can do everything they need it to do. And that saves them money. You know, I mean, we love to talk about performance and quarter miles here. And, you know, Kyle loves to, to take every car he, he has, even, you know, cars that weren't meant to do that around his track and slide them sideways. And that's all great and fun. But that's like 1% use case for the, for the general public. People need vehicles that they can afford, that do the tasks they need them to do, and, and they don't have to, you know, they don't want to have to go to even service. Think about how much better it is for if you had an ID4 rather than a, a, a Honda CRV or a Toyota RAV4. Like, it's so inconvenient for a family to have to disrupt their life to bring it in and, and get an oil change and tune ups. It, th those, even those little things, uh, the fact that it uses so, so much less service, just makes it a better vehicle for the family. So, the ID4 is my choice in this new category. I'd love to see this new Hyundai. To be honest with you, because I'm much more excited about that than the than the Nissan Aria, um, uh, and and the Hyundai could the Hyundai would be the vehicle that could change my mind. I'm not saying it will um, because of what Kyle and I talked about the efficiency. I love efficient vehicles, and I like what Hyundai's been doing in general. So um, I can't wait to get behind the wheel of that vehicle. Dom, what what's your pick? Man, I well, I like a lot about the Model Y, but you know it's. I'm 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 a value buyer because uh, I'm poor, <laughs> basically. Um, so yeah, I would definitely look at see what, as a value. So you know, ID four is you know right there. It's affordable. But the Hyundai is you know looks could be pretty good. I mean, they've always always been like a value brand as well. You know, with a you know fair amount of you know you get a decent amount of tech and a decent amount of uh, mater quality materials for the price. Uh, so that's kind of you know if I had if I had no uh, budget limitations I would be definitely looking at Model Y just because there's you know it's so much about it is is great with the supercharger network and range and you know I just Tesla has been doing this for a while now and they've got it down as I think as good as anybody. Um, yeah, no question. The Y is awesome. Uh, you know I think I may have mentioned on the podcast. You know, well, we know Tom's getting his 2021 three. My parents are getting their brand new Y oh, yeah. uh, with all the updates. So we'll see uh, how this goes. But we'll basically, uh, it's great. But, the, you know, the ID4 is $17,500 less right. than Model Y. Right. And honestly, driving them, the ID4 drives better around town. The Y is great. It's a great road tripper. It's got 250 kilowatt charging. You have the supercharger right. network. You go without thinking about it. Anyway, sorry to derail our conversation. That's all right. But, I, uh, I need to I was, drive. I was, I was curious, like what I, I thought you were going to say Aria, and I was going to uh, try and figure out why because I still don't get it. But uh, that's where it, I was going. The most um, of all the the videos that you've made for the channel recently, it's it's one of the most popular ones that you've made. So there's clearly interest in the Aria. Whether that. That doesn't mean sales, it, but it is an interest. Yeah, we have. Uh, so the last three big videos were Lucid uh, the, in in order. Basically, we had Lucid, Aria, Mustang Maki, -E, and today ID4. Mm. And we're going to see in three months' time who has the most views, because right. uh, you know, surprisingly, uh, a Mustang Maki -E has a ton of interest. 
Yeah. I was not expecting that at all. Mm. Uh, like way more than some Tesla stuff, which I was like, wow. Uh, and and ID four was okay, uh, but Aria was the was a big surprise to me. Right. I think if if the Nissan if Nissan can get the price down, you know, close close to ID four. I mean, if I had to choose between ID four and the Nissan Alta or uh, Aria, and they were close in price, I be tempted to go aria just i, I just like the, the interior so much and i don't mind the exterior the, and the exterior of the id4 i think is boring sorry <laughs> <laughs> it just it bores me to tears um yeah so the aria, aria's exterior styling is a bit more um you know the, uh, what's the what's the word uh controversial maybe but I think that I think that's in his to his to his favor, but uh, yeah. But let's talk about it. It's another. front wheel drive that kills it for oh, me. Yeah, they should have true. made it. Really it has to be only all wheel drive. Yeah, I can only do that. Yeah, all -wheel drive. I'm excited for the e all wheel drive thing that they have. And sorry about the dog barking. He's barking at the snow. I think puppers <laughs> falling. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Hey, uh, so let's move on to another car. Uh, we we mentioned these guys a couple of weeks ago when they teased the production phase of their of their three wheeled car, uh, but they're back in the news. Aptera has revealed its flightless bird. Aptera means wingless in Latin, uh, and they have opened up pre orders. So they kick things off by offering two special editions to begin with: the Aptera Paradigm and Paradigm Plus. The Paradigm comes with a four, uh, 40 kilowatt hour battery, which they say is good for 400 miles of range and includes enhanced audio full solar and special interior upgrades. Uh, they're making 220 copies of this. Get that number, 220 volts. Uh, but if you want to order one, I've got some bad news. It's sold out. Uh, so the Paradigm Plus is the 100 kilowatt hour battery version, good for 1,000 miles, they say. And they're making 110 examples of this one. There's that number again. But if you want to run, uh, you're out of luck because it too is sold out. Uh, you know, not a whole lot of, not a whole, you know, all the other 330 vehicles. Um, so if you haven't ordered yet, for $100, you can still reserve an Aptera. And, and you can also choose exactly which battery size and which options you want. So there's four different battery sizes, and you can choose between front wheel or all wheel drive and how much of the vehicle you want to cover in solar cells. Uh, I configured one with a 400 mile battery, uh, which starts at twenty nine thousand eight hundred dollars. Added the all the solar and all wheel drive, which uh, I should add is uh, supposed to give you a zero to sixty in three point five seconds. So that's as quick as a Mustang Mach E GT. That's that totaled up to a mere thirty three thousand two hundred dollars before incentives. So I'm not sure you can pay this little. For this kind of performance from any other automaker, it is a two-seater, so it's not as practical as like some of the um, other things. And as you, if you're looking at it on YouTube or if you've seen the Aptera in the past, it is not a conventional-looking <laughs> vehicle. It's made out of lightweight composites, and that's kind of the idea. Uh, the whole thing that make it very light and very aerodynamic vehicle, make it as efficient as possible, and that's like the whole thing. Oh, also. Uh, we learned this week it can tank turn. So, Kyle, what do you think about that? Well, look, this has all the makings to be a Kyle Connor special. Really? It looks weird. It's really fast. Uh, you know, it's everything I love about a car. It's a compromised solution, but it's actually almost too good for me to fall in love with it. You know, I love three-wheelers, specifically the Morgan three-wheeler. It's my dream car. And that's only because it's not good at anything. In fact, it's so bad at anything, <laughs> it's amazing at being so terrible. And this is almost kind of like good, so I'm not as excited about it. Although, would I drive one around every day? 100%. Uh, this is totally my, my kind of vehicle. I'd love to get the uh, solar cells, play around with some of that charging. I think it'd make a great series. And uh, honestly, we should consider uh, getting one for the new Out of Spec Reviews channel, do like a six month, run one for six months and see what it's all about. So um, it's definitely on the list to consider of the vehicles we plan to get next year. 
Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what their time frame is for deliveries. I don't. Yeah, think they it's haven't wrong, said it's it's not they, too far out though, right? Uh, right. No, they they uh, took a bunch of notes when when they were doing this. Um, so they they want to have twenty thousand uh, units a year production, and they're going to do it in Southern California somewhere. Um, but I'm not seeing that. I I do think they want to do it sooner than later because I think they learned a lesson the first time around. This so this is like the rebirth of a company from, you know, like uh, I think they originally started in two thousand and five and kind of uh, ended in twenty eleven. But they got sold to a Chinese company, and there's a whole whole story there. Um, I think they're supposed to start production this year, Dom, in 2021. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think it, I think that that's right, what that's their plan is to actually start delivering yeah. these in, in 2021, which is a little surprising because they still haven't worked out a, like some of charging. their technology. Tom, it's tell us like about they, the charging. Yeah. Oh, man. So, like, you know, Kyle, I have to give Kyle oh, yeah. credit. He's the first one that noticed, at least the first one on Inside EVs, that noticed in the video um, when you, they briefly show the, the somebody like trying to plug in the vehicle, that's a Tesla connector and a Tesla inlet. What the heck is it doing with a Tesla connector? You know, um, so uh, I, I immediately followed up and, and emailed the company and said, look, you can't just show us this right. and not explain it. Um, and, uh, you know, they obviously wanted us to talk about it or you didn't have to put this in the video. You know, I mean, right. they didn't have to have a screenshot of that. So I followed up. I ended up speaking last night with the CEO, uh, Chris Anthony. Okay. And, um, oh, I badgered him to try to give me more information on it. And um, he won't budge. And uh, he's just he won't commit to um uh, saying that they're going to be using tesla charging uh technology uh but he won't say they're not there you go. Uh, and, and he also uh on a couple of occasions uh, kind of uh spoke about how poor he believes the j1772 connector and uh -huh. implementation is and how you know when when they started back in in 2005 as you said there was no j1772 there was no standard and um so they were back then trying to figure out, well, you know, what what what's going to be the, the the plug, and then Tesla came out with what they were going to be using, and it was like, wow, this is you know so nice and elegant. So he said he was he was hoping that um, you know the 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 SAE standard would be similar to that, or maybe just adopt what Tesla was working on. But then when he saw the J seventy seventy two, he was like, "Oh my God, you've got to be kidding me!" So we know how he feels about the J seventeen seventy two. Now, it doesn't mean that they're going to be using this. I mean, I I think they're going to, but it doesn't mean they're going to be using the, the Tesla connector because he's he's just not committing. But the one telling thing that I see every time we Dom, you and I were on that that Aptera presentation this week there was a presentation for media and then even with my conversation with 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 Anthony um whenever he talks about DC fast charging he doesn't refer to it as DC fast charging he refers to it as supercharging all right so who refers to DC fast charging as supercharging outside of Tesla or people that are using you know Tesla technology so I mean the pieces are there but he won't uh, you know, I, I, for half an hour, I, I, I was really just saying, come on, you're going to have to tell some somebody's got to be the first person to hear it. Make it let it be me. Um, but uh, he, he wouldn't budge, but he certainly wouldn't say they're not going to use. It. He said we're still sorting out partners for things like charging and, 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 and standards and so forth and so on. So it's definitely in play, which I thought was really, really interesting. Nobody for anybody that's listening here that that isn't aware of this. I'm, I'm sure most people are aware of it. Nobody but Tesla, you Tesla developed this proprietary uh, connector and charging system and, and nobody else has used it. Now, there's been a lot of talk about Tesla saying, oh, all of our patents are, are open sourced and, and, uh, and anybody can use our technology. That's not really true. Uh, uh, other t companies, um, you know, well, first of all, if you didn't have access to the supercharger network, no company would want to use that connector because they'd basically be on an island with, yeah. where they would have a connector that, that can't plug into anything. But Tesla does protect their, their that, that technology. I remember I was at the 2017 CES 
And ChargePoint came out with a ChargePoint home unit that they put on the floor and it had the Tesla connector on it. And I tweeted out quickly, wow, I didn't see this uh, happening. Uh, you know, that ChargePoint was going to now sell, start selling. Um, yeah, there it is right there. And uh, I, I went back to the ChargePoint booth like an hour later and it was gone. Huh. And no one would tell me why it was off the floor. Uh, 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 you know, this was the first day of CES. Very few people even saw it. But I later on, uh, I know a lot of people at ChargePoint. I got one of them to tell me off the record, look, Tesla saw your tweet and they called us and said, take that thing off the floor right now. So like they didn't even let them what? display something like that. So, so um, you know, that, 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 that I found that really interesting. So much for anybody can use our technology. Now, it's possible that it's because the t connector says Tesla. It's uh -huh. possible if that was covered, they would have been allowed to leave it there. But then why wouldn't have ChargePoint just put a sticker over it? You know, and, yeah. and okay, we'll cover up the Tesla, yeah. you know, you know, and, 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 and ChargePoint wasn't, selling those units at the time they just they told me they were trying to demonstrate that look our the charge point home can work with any standard you know we can you, you know we can use the 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 the, the menix type 2 we could use the 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 j1772 a tesla connector it'll it'll work with anything you just stick a plug on it and, and a, a different a different cable and connector um but so you know Tesla is very protective of, right. of their of, of of their you know IP and uh, rightfully so. But you know we they they also at the same time talk out of the other side of their mouth and say oh anybody we're here to just advance the technology no. anyone can use our technology. It's that's not, not open source. In, that's in the purest the case. In the purest sense of open source code, right? It's not open source. So right. Tesla say oh you know we open source our stuff out, but it's open to anyone. It's not. The agreement I mean, is. They won't take action against anyone that wants to use them until some they them. do. Not, not other patents, just some of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, but like, it's it's not in their interest to open up their company to the world. They don't do that. It's right. it's 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 a massive misconception about Tesla that hey, here's everything of ours. They're not an open source but uh, just, company. Why should they be? Why should they be? They but, they spent right. money inventing it. So just to bring this back to up, Tara. Uh, I think what's going on here is that they like the Tesla connector and they want to use the Tesla connector, but Tesla is asking for a bunch of money and they don't have a bunch of money at this point. And so they're trying to figure out what they need to do, how they can get it in the vehicle. So why would Tesla say yes? I don't understand that bit. They're going to be such a small niche um, boutique. It might, just tickle, it might just tickle Elon's funny bone to see these. Nah, nah, you he doesn't know. like. He doesn't like competition. He wants world domination and interplanetary <laughs> he domination. He doesn't he not like three wheeled vehicles. He's already said uh, he, this. Yeah, he, yeah, it's, um, yeah. Because he crashed something yeah. like that. Well, he the, crashed the Arkimoto. The Arkimoto. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Which I, I still haven't driven yeah, one, but I really yeah, want I to. Those look like a ton of fun. But I I be a, yeah, we, that, we gotta get on should, that. At hey, some they have point. them in QS. I was thinking they have like a. You can rent them in Key West, and I've never been to Key West. And I really want to go. Oh, really? So we should go. Oh, well, let's go to Key West together. Oh, really? I'll be down there in a few weeks. Uh, seriously, I will be. Yeah, because I'm doing some Porsche, Porsche stuff. Uh, so let's go. Yeah, yeah. One so, more. Uh, we'll see. I have a Tycon on Aero Wheels to do a on test. the charging, though. Why would Tesla let Aptera use 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 their connect their technology? Let let's say, you know, how about this for an argument? Now that they that if they're going to license, and I know for a fact that at least two OEMs that I know of approached Tesla in the past years ago and tried to strike a deal with them to use right. the supercharger network. Fact, I spoke with the people that were in the meetings um, and and, uh, and the price of admission was just too high. Um, but, you know, maybe for a little niche brand like Aptera, uh, you know, maybe Tesla bends because they, you know, they, let's, let's face it, hundreds of thousands of these aren't going to be sold, right. you know, the Apteras. They're not going to clog up supercharger stations. No. You know what I mean? That, that like maybe if if they allowed BMW or Ford to use it, and you know you'd have Tesla cus customers angry. Geez, there's I pulled in and there's four Mach E's here, and I couldn't plug in. This is crazy. Um, you know, so if 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 they were going to license it and grant a, 
of people to use it, this might be the right partnership. Um, you know, and, and it makes some money and, you know, Aptera gets a win because now they've all of a sudden got this tremendous network out there that, that you know, that people identify with as quality, as, you know, and, and, and anybody, let's face it, anyone wants to hook their cart, their wagon up to the Tesla train, you know, especially little startups, you know, so um, it might work for that reason. If the price of admission isn't too high, because let's face it, Terra doesn't have a lot of money. Um, uh, Tesla might see this as a PR win for them. Like, look, we do. If the deal is right for us, we will let people use our network. You know, so I don't I, I don't rule it out. Um, you know, it, I, it, there's got to be a reason why that connector's on there, Dominic. It's not just they decided to put it on there and roll the dice and 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 and, and hopefully um, you know hopefully Tesla will, will 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 let us use it one day. They would have just started off with 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 J seventeen seventy two. So there's something here that mm. this isn't just. There's some there's there's more than smoke here, and and uh, we're going to be on top of it, and I'm going to keep pestering uh, Aptera to 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 give us whatever they're willing to offer. So a couple a couple other things about this car I want to mention real quick before we move on. We're going to wrap this thing up really quick. Um, so in, just in case you're wondering, it it can supposedly tow a little bit, uh, something lightweight, and they're looking for a trailer design. So uh, if you have an idea, uh, send them a, send them a message. Um, the, but the really cool, uh, cool thing, uh, no pun intended, about this thing is the is the cooling. As you can see, there's no grill, right? So how do you cool it? And I guess what they're going to do, and they had problems with this at the very original one back a decade ago when they were there in this like uh, ch X Prize challenge, and they had to do so many miles around the track, and they didn't make it because it overheated. So what they're doing now is they're going to put cooling channels in the skin of the vehicle and it's going to be connected to the climate control so you know the uh, coolant on the top could get heat heated from the sun and that could warm the cabin or i know they have a they have some sort of far out concepts in, in mind for this so it it's kind of I'm, I'm looking for more details on them i can't wait to see some like cross sections of how that looks and and how they actually get that to perform properly um yeah. So you, one more thing, Tom. I know we're we're up against it. Yeah. Martin, can you r run that video again? Can you get it to the point where you see the shot of the of the interior and the center screen? Tell me, tell me what that looks like. I like the interior of the thing, by the way. I want to focus on the center display screen. And if I can't find it on the video, there's a still in the the other. Well, the yeah, other. It, it just came up yeah. before where you should. Yeah. So. I mean, it looks just like the Model 3, um, yes. the, lay, the layout of the screen. I mean, it, it, even the vehicle, the, there's a, yeah. you, you see the vehicle driving, it looks just, it, it, it's, it's there's too center. much, there's too much smoke here, guys. Like there's, there's something going on there. Uh, you know, I, I really believe that we're going to get a cool um, uh, announcement about something at some point. Oh, you think there's more Tesla in it than this? I, I think Tesla might be helping them. I, I don't know. Let, <laughs> let, 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 let's see. I mean, the, the, it just seems like there's there's too much. Uh, that, that that center screen, get close-up looks of it, it really, well, the the, the, the part where you can actually see the, uh, the, the display. And uh, it really, it looks like the Model 3 layout. So, uh, you know, I, I know we're, we're up against it, Dom, but I just had to point that out. Right. So somebody else also pointed out that the the stalks and the switch gear, uh, they look like they're taken from a you know, a, a salvaged, you know, Model S. It could but, be. I mean, I mean, I don't know. They just put an orange thing on the end of it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, someone pointed out how similar the the, the stalks and the switch gear were, but uh, maybe. Anyway, I'm I'm glad, I'm glad these guys are back because uh, it's, it's such an interesting concept and it's like it's just so far out there. I kind of wish they had gone with the tilting wheels uh, in the front, so you could you could bring those wheels in a bit because now it's got a pretty wide stance. But if if they tilted, you know, you could bring them in, and then when you go around turns, the whole body, would, you know, the wheels would tilt, and maybe it's, you get some tilt of the body as well. And I think that would be you know uh, fun. Uh, it'd be a, you know an enjoyable experience but anyway so we're yeah we're up against it so i just want to hit a couple notes before we go um so if you like electric pickup trucks there is a uh, little lesser known 
a company trying to bring one to market called Atlas, A-T-L-I-S, and they've revealed their XT pickup uh, pricing and battery pack options. So we're looking at, what are we looking at? Um, let see, 0 to 60 and 5 with about 3.5 seconds, so it could be pretty quick. Uh, lots of power. I'm looking for price. I have the really bad notes for some reason. Okay, here we are. So they're going to have a 300, 400, and 500 uh, mile range options. Uh, 125 kilowatt hour, 300 mile version starts at $45,000 on a short wheelbase truck. They're going to have yeah different wheelbases and cabins, and I think there's a dually version as well. Uh, there's a 500 mile, 250 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, version for $85,000 starting at. Uh, it has a conventional towing ability of between 5,000 and 20,000 pounds. The truck has a fifth wheel tailoring uh, towing uh, capacity of between 10,000 to 35,000 pounds. Uh, so yeah. So anyway, something to look at. It's a bit of a dark horse, I've got to say, but it's a, you know, it's not a, not a bad looking truck. And I know the people involved are, you know, are very dedicated and very serious about actually bringing this. So it should be good. They need to secure some funding, I understand, though. Uh, so moving along real quick, unless someone has something, if anyone has something, anything to say about anything, just like jump right in. Uh, so Audi e-tron GT is entering production, and that's pretty interesting. That's the same, it's on the same J1 performance platform as the Taycan. So, but I don't think it's gonna be quite as quick uh, we'll have to see if they have what the different variants are, but the right now the zero to sixty time they're they're talking about is three point five seconds, so that's a little bit faster than the Taycan 4S, but obviously not as fast as the the higher versions of that. Um, let's see, eight hundred and probably a little bit cheaper. You would right. think being an Audi, not Porsche, not by much. If it's still a hundred grand, it's a hundred grand, but. Probably a bit Maybe cheap. a bit more posh too. And it has a wireless charging yeah. option for home. So I, I like that a lot. So I think wireless uh, charging that is going to be big in the future. It's uh, still not talked about. It's still not uh, happening no. yet. But it regens at 265 kilowatts. My favorite stats on the car. Oh, yeah. What regen? I, 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 have an, I have an interesting story about the, the GT. Um, a couple of years ago at one of the auto shows, I was talking to somebody that I know at Audi and I've known him for many years. So um, every now and then it'll give me a bit of tid, tidbit of news that really shouldn't be out there. Um, uh, when Audi first designed this vehicle, it was a lot more aggressive than what, what, what you see now. Very, you know, super aggressive. And, you know, they have to get sign off on Volkswagen Group and uh, Porsche blocked it. Porsche said, uh, no, we are the performance brand. Make that look more like an Audi. It I, Evidently, it looked better <laughs> than the Taycan. <laughs> and the Porsche people were not happy with that. So yeah. they said, tone that down, make it look a little bit more Audi-ish and less Taycan, less sporty uh and 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 the, and it was and it was redesigned but the original design was supposed to be a lot more wild than what you see here is, is that the production version on the screen there martin no i think i think this is an early when's this one from oh, this concept yeah that's, yes this, so this this may have been a halfway house as tom was saying when they were still playing with concepts and uh it has been softened even from this uh that the the, the back end is different so uh because that would be cool that'd be like whoa that's the Batmobile. Yeah. It's, um, it's been softened a little bit from this. Yeah, it's hard to tell. It's still got some camo on and stuff, and all the YouTube reviewers had that 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 uh, that camo camouflage version. Well, Porsche had their say on the design of wow. the vehicle and and said, you know, uh, tone it down a little bit. You know, guys, um, we're the performance brand. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Okay, so also real quick. Uh, oh damn. Um, so. Kyle, I believe you're going to love this. Mercedes-Benz e-Sprinter is going to be introduced into the U.S. in three years, and that's going to be the next gen on the electric versatility platform. Uh, two wheelbases, two battery pack sizes, real-world drive. It'll probably look a little different, and there's a number of different configurations. There's a, like a box van, a flatbed, a people mover, um, specialty vehicles like ambulances. So, yeah, it's going to be... Uh, Interesting, maybe a hundred and twenty-five kilowatt hour battery. It's one of the one of the battery sizes. I think that people are kicking around. I don't expect to see a super long range version of this uh, for a while. 
Um, but yeah, that's something to look up for. And finally, I just want to end on this. Uh, the Porsche Taycan Turbo S is faster in the quarter mile than the Tesla Model S uh, performance. Uh, drag times did a, did a race. Both cars were brought to the track, trailered to the track, 100% batteries. They ran three, th at least three times. And the, it's very close. Uh, and you get to take it into consideration that the Taycan is a lot more exp expensive. And it's actually a sports car where the uh, Model S is not really, a, you know, it's, that's not really, it's whatever. It's not, it's, it's, yeah, it's a different kind of a thing, but, you know, close enough, you know, and they're, and on the track, they're very close, but uh, definitely the Taycan is, is quicker. So I, I think that, I think that settles that for now until Tesla decides they can turn up the notch a bit turn up some notches. Maybe Porsche will too. We'll see. But anyway, that brings us to the end of our show. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. If you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post, the YouTube comment section below, or on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread. Um, don't forget you can find and follow all of our panelists on Twitter. Tom Malogny is at Tomalog. Martin Lee is at EV News Daily. Kyle Connor is at OutSpec, and I'm at Dominic underscore Y. Click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. That's really handy. I, I love that feature about uh, YouTube. And um, yeah, we'll see you all next week. Have a good one. Ciao.